Welcome to Layback with Betfair. Joined by the A-Team, we're back. Hello, welcome to Layback with Betfair, education series, episode one. I'm Tom Haylock, joined by Brett and Darren Carroll. How are you guys? Well, thanks, mate. Great, thanks, Tom. It's great to have you guys here. Now, you are harness punters and some or very successful harness punters in your own right, and you also provide expert tips uh, at Betfair. So you can get them on the Betfair Hub and the Betfair app as well. I just want to bring some data up so everyone knows the kind of guys we're talking to today. Now, your stats are sensational for the last financial year. 820 bets for us, recommended bets. You've had a profit of 64.99 units. And a profit on turnover of 7.9%, guys. So incredible performance for us, but for all our uh, loyal followers and all your loyal followers, thank you so much for, for providing great content for us. Um, how do you feel about that, Brett? Great. If I can uh, help people getting on the trots, I'm, I'm more than happy and happy to share our knowledge. Uh, I've always been very keen to, to share my knowledge and I don't really think it helps to keep it all to ourselves. You know, It's good. Um, Darren, we'll get to you first about a bit of background on both of you, if you want to talk on behalf of your brother, yep. but um, yep. also yourself and, and how you got into the game. Um, I suppose we're lifers. Um, yes. Both sides of our family um, are trots participants and um, massive racing people, I suppose. So we would have been going to the trots um, in a pram, getting pushed around um, from day one type thing. Um, we... Um, had horses ourselves as a family, so Dad trained horses. So we used to get up um, before school and train the horses. So uh, we feel like we know the horses, and even those early days, doing things like attending trials and then going to the trots and things like that. So our background, right from day one, has been largely uh, heavily involved with the horse and heavily involved with the game, and just love the sport. And yeah, we're lifers. It's as simple as that. Good. Anything to add to that? Not oh, much the same. Brett's yeah. driven a winner. Is a oh, right. what? <laughs> He's driven a winner. Yeah. Driven a, you've driven a winner. Yeah. yeah, I sat in the cart, drove one home. You need to be licensed. Gave... Were you licensed back then? Is that yeah. Or, yeah. I was <laughs> 17 or 16 or something. Wow. I can't quite recall. But yeah, I was a. Darren owned the horse. I drove it and my other brother trained it. It was a. Incredible. It yeah. was a good day. Mm. Incredible. It's pretty. I wish I was more of a punter then, though. <laughs> it's pretty good odds. Yeah, it's about $20. $20. Mm. Mm. Did like it. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, you, you're so knowledgeable, you two, and it's. I, I'm. I was excited to to come and chat with you today because uh, I'm very excited to hear about your your the way you go about finding winners and, and form and providing tips for us. Um, how do you just just firstly, how do you go about? We'll start with markets. Do you do you price up your horses, um, Brett, leaning into a, a meeting um, and have a vague idea, or do you do it? Is it hard and fast rule where you price every runner? How does that work? Can vary. I, I'm, I have a market. I've marketed so many races now that it's in my head yep. that I basically categorise the field. Yes. So I might have one horse on the top line, two on the second line, and then I might have no other chances. And so I'll I'll, est- I'll have a established how many horses can't win in my in my market. Yep. So and I by even just by looking at it, I can go oh that that top lines. You know, two dollars eighty. The second line, seven dollars fifty, because I've done so many of them. But yeah. if you want to break it down, you you can do it. And I generally have usually marketed my own market to around hundred yeah. percent. I've tried lower, but it's too hard because. But we we do price hard. every Victorian harness racing meeting yes. at around about one hundred and thirty percent. But then you can cut it down individually, as Brett's talking about. But every race is priced at one hundred and thirty percent. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Tell me about the ways you guys bet. Um, is it in play, pre-play, a bit of everything? Do you bet solely at Betfair? Um, do you bet at the corporates and whatnot, Brett? It's mostly at Betfair. Yes. Uh, it's because, generally speaking, the markets, that are, the fixed price markets are, are um, homogenous. Lately, for whatever reason, hmm. there's been a bit of variation amongst some of the operators, which means we'll have a look at that because some variations could occur early, which could be attractive. But I would say for a long time, more than 90% on Betfair wow. and more than 90% late betting. Darren probably bets more in play than me, but 
uh, yeah, largely because the market gets uh, gets down low. I mean, obviously, Betfair is always low. Yeah. But the the liquidity gets really high in the last few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Surprises me uh, that you have ninety percent, and that would be rare for harness punters, I dare say. Rare for punters because you know we hear so many stories of our mates and other people who are you know might have. 30 different corporate accounts and yeah. things like that. But, you know, we've shied away from that completely. Loyal uh, Betfair. Yeah. yeah, just love Betfair. But also, you know, and I've heard some stories before about, um, you know, corporates and, you know, you're more getting a free tip out there as well. And yep. um, this way you sort of, you know, you save it to the, the end and get a better price, what we find anyhow, a better price at the end. Yeah. Well, I feel like it'd be hard to get set and get a bet on early at corporates anyway, especially if you're betting into markets at 100 and 30%, there might be slight errors, um, but is that a challenge? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think the challenge is to be patient. Yep. And I don't think that's that big a challenge for me. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I, I like to identify where the markets are wrong sometimes, and, and you can identify that the later you wait, the better as well, because, um, and you use sometimes the markets as an opportunity to do more work. Um, so, you know, we've done all our work prior to it and there might be something that gets um, flucked in and you go, well, gee, have I missed something there? So you go back and have another look at it and go, well, no, I haven't missed it. I think that flux wrong. And then get the opportunity um, when the liquidity gets into Betfair in the last five minutes then to either lay that horse and then use some of that lay money to then back a couple others as well. So I'm big on that, um, laying and backing in the same race. And if the lay wins, obviously it's a bad result, but... Um, you know, backing yourself and using that um, to back a couple other horses in the race. And, you know, we talk about some massive odds some of the um, the outsiders get out to on Betfair late. Yeah. We'll talk a bit about that as well. Yeah. I think Terry Layton made some really in, uh, in points that mirror a lot of the Victorian trots yes. experience because he's from WA yes. races. So it's probably similar as in it's a reasonably, you know, it's a, it's a small location, so yeah. to speak. Victorian tries of horses and yep yeah it's Victorian tries to got a lot of good punters I find and WA races I'm sure will be the same so he's saying there's some good punters out there and when they bet the prices get over overreacted yeah. which is yeah. exactly the same as what yeah. happens here yeah. and I'm happy to to let those people bet because the market will overreact because just like we're not always right they're not always right mm. and you just let that market do its thing, and then you can you can wait till later, and your opinion can can um, can come through then. But the, over, the the old adage was that money talked, or that the markets were smart. It just doesn't hold true anymore. The markets aren't smart because the one person is smart, but then the people who follow, they're not smart because they're actually copying a poor odd. Poor so, odds. so what you're saying is, uh, I don't know when when to harness. So if there's a harness meeting on a Saturday night, when do the markets at a corporate co open for that? Are they usually Friday? Usually 10 a.m. 10 a.m. that on, day? On, on a Saturday yeah. now. There you yeah. go. So yeah. what you're saying is someone, a sharp operator, might have a bet into that market, mm. and then a lot of people follow the money. We see even Betfair's got your drifters and firmers notifications now on, mm. on the app, but you've got the flames at corporates and, and plunge apps and stuff mm. like that. So what you're saying is these horses might get back. There might be an early mistake, but they're getting overplayed, mm. and they're potentially lay options at Betfair. Correct. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's that's fascinating. And it's the same with, uh, I know Terry Layton um, said that in his um, Layback with Betfair Education series. Um, if you haven't watched that, check that out on YouTube as well. It's a, it's a great insightful mm. piece. I know you, you watched it, Brett. Um, how do you, we'll, we'll go back a little bit, um, Darren, but how do you start with doing a form for a, a harness meeting? Yeah, look, it's a combination of a lot of things. So we would have watched every trial in the state um, prior so are they readily available yeah probably 99 yep. percent readily available so um there's there's footage of it and i suppose um the edges changed like 10 to 12 years ago i was going to most of the trials like i'd go to terang on a sunday morning and drive you know two and a half hours to watch three trials um but then it's changed <laughs> And you, know, you had a real edge then because yeah. no one else went. Yeah. And I had that video footage of that trial and I'd share it around a little bit. And that was really good information and used to share it around in a circle of your friends type thing. But then it's changed. It's all available to everyone, which is a good thing because the more people have the information. Um, is it a good thing? Uh, well, I think it's a good thing from a point of view of um, 
confidence in the market and things like that. Yes. From a selfish point yes. of view, no. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we had an edge there, but it's about moving with the times and understanding that edge might have gone and you don't have that anymore. So I think our edge is, is trying to do more and more work and it's not that easy to keep up. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, a lot of people are working full time and, um, you know, people cut corners and things like that. But I think, you know, so right from the start, we have watched every trial and we have a catalogue of all that information and then you get stuck into the form and, you know, you're watching probably a replay of the last start um, or the last few starts, depending on the barrier draws. So you're matching up and you're trying to get a map of the race in your own mind. Yep. Um, so you, do you, do you know your own version of speed maps? Absolutely. For, for race? Every, every race, yes. um, you're doing your own version of a speed map and then... Once you've done your form, your trials, your speed map, then looking at things like sectional data and all that information combined together and then coming up with a map and then coming up with a plan of attack to a betting approach. Mm. You mentioned sectional data. Uh, is that something you use, Brett? Yeah, I, I love the sectional data. HIV have got a, uh, they put a chip in the saddle cloth of every yes. horse that goes around and the data is available on the HIV Trots website. Yeah, it's actually quite illuminating what you can throw up there and i'll just keep a record of horses i'm following they're not always going to find the exact suitable race mm. but it's just another little angle it's sort of like having a fresh view because the bank of knowledge that we're building up that's what we do and it's a lot of work but it's actually we find it quite enjoyable just to, to keep that bank of knowledge up yes. because without that bank it's interesting to talk about terry Layton. he talked about how he was went on the road betting and he found it hard to keep up. Yeah, That's right. You've got to keep that bank of knowledge up because things change so quickly. You know, you could have a race worked out and all of a sudden a key scratching changes the map of the race. You need to be ready to act on that. You can't be going, oh, I better look at that race again. You won't have time to do that. So that's why, yeah, to keep that bank of knowledge up, we try to keep up with every horse in the state, basically. Yeah. And that also means all the trainers, yeah. the stables can change, variations, different things happen. Drivers, they have form lines just like horses. Yeah. And it's interesting, the thing about data is, which is fascinating, but horses aren't machines. Yes. Drivers are human, you know, all that stuff. And that's where you can't rely on data alone because of that in our opinion is that where is that what, what where you get your benefit from not because there's obviously some big data players in whatever sport racing mm. greyhounds harness as well there's there's a lot of automated clients is that where you find your little uh, edge i guess in in markets and betting and, and focusing on the human element and watching replays and and trials more so than the data teams i think it's a combination of all the information information that's available and being able to synthesize that information as efficiently as possible, I guess. I mean, obviously data would be great. And if it works for you, that's fine. I'm not yes. going to argue with that at all. Yeah. But yeah, I think there's a lot, there's so much uh, I can't understand to remove the subjectivity. I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I like to have an opinion and I like to blame myself if it's a bad bet as opposed to you know, a bad drive or something like that. So, you know. I got that wrong. <laughs> Do you have a, a big database of information? You mentioned you, you're trying to follow every horse in Victoria. Um, how do you record all your knowledge? And do you work together on this? Do you share? Is it an advantage to, to be brothers and to talk and, and share and, and whatnot? Yeah, well, I suppose um, the database is up here. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. How many probably, horses are there in Victoria? probably not as scientific as some, some could question. possibly be. But <laughs> be a lot. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about, you know, eight or nine meetings a week. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of horses and a lot of races. Uh, so it's very hard to keep up with sometimes. But People will be gobsmacked that um, you don't have a... A lot uh, of people yeah. keep databases, mm. I know, but yeah. it's something we've never done. Mm. I think it's good to keep your brain active, Yes. to be honest. Yep. It's good practice to keep your brain working. So yeah. maybe the fact that we do probably discuss every meeting every day, we'll touch base and talk about, but we end up still coming up with different angles. Yeah. But, we'll we'll um, miss things yeah. um, individually yeah. and hopefully by the cross-reference that we do, then we uh, eliminate the amount of times we miss things. But there'll be times when, um, you know, I will have rated a trial differently than what Brett will and say, you know, or vice versa, and we'll go back and have another look at it and go, oh, gee, I didn't see that or... Um, but that's the strength that we have of being able to 
to, I suppose, have years and years of doing the form exactly the same way. We do everything, you know, whether that's right or wrong, it's yep. just the way we do it. And um, it's probably a benefit that by the time we get together, um, it's amazing the consistency that we have in our in our thought processes. Back to the market, sorry, yeah. Tom. Like yeah. sometimes the market's really useful mm. because you see a move for something and you think, mm. well, that move suggests that my map's wrong. Mm. I'll have a look. I go, you know what? I think I got that wrong. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's that plays to all sports and um, sports and horse racing and greyhounds as well. The market can be mm. really important and, and even the early market. At your corporates, people have an early bet, and you it might make you go back and think mm, about the race yeah. again. And, and what's this about? Yeah, that's absolutely. To me, that's the best thing about the market shifts is yes. giving us an opportunity to go back and have another look. Yeah, and that that might be why ninety percent of your activity per se is on Betfair because you take everything into account heading in and, and you bet late. Yeah, and I, I think I just love the the fact that Betfair right in front of you, you can tell you what your profit and loss is on one horse. Yes. And because you've shot, I just love that opportunity just to see it all in front of you rather than thinking, gee, I've got this bet with this account, this bet with this account. How much have I got this horse going for? And then once it gets to in play, then I'm going to think on my feet again about, hey, I haven't backed that horse is. yet. Yeah. And I want to lay that one because the whole map's changed and things like that. So Some, that's what I love about it. Funnily yeah. enough, Tom, like you, you asked us about big wins and that. I don't really recall them anymore because, but often I'm just wrapped, whereas sometimes I've really liked something and had a decent crack at it and it hasn't won, mm. but somehow I've managed to get a get out of jail and have a, had a saver on the winner and yep. at least squared the race. And I just, and I just call my, I call that like defense, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, you've got to live to fight another day, you know? Mm. Yeah. Cause you know, we're going to be up tomorrow and they're going to be on again, you know? And that's the benefit of, the, the in play when things happen be mm. able to know your form and know your form back to front be able to react really quickly and be able to um, seize the opportunities when they when they arrive it's a great yeah. point you make brett because uh, something we talk about a lot and we've got responsible gambling week coming up in in a little bit as well um and it is a topic that gets talked about a lot is not being reactive to one race or one bet it there's always another race um on again tomorrow on again tomorrow and that's that's the way you guys play um yeah. you you 7.9 percent profit on turnover at, at betfair according to your tips at betfair hub and, and on the app but it's a long game there's mm -hmm. no it's not there's no last race of the day um, and that's your philosophy you bet yeah. into a lot of races and yeah, yeah. a lot i've changed i mean i'm always and darren will be the same you're always moving things a little bit you never you can never stay the same you know because things change so i've found lately i've i'll sit down before a meeting and strategize my bets and stick to those you know i'll still play reacting according to the race and things yes. like that but i'll have worked out i'm having you know so many units on this horse and i'll stick to that so rather than you know get a win in the first race and then just sort of bet up on that Yeah, because I've already organised what I'm doing and if the first one wins, that's great, but it doesn't mean I'm going to increase my bets for the other races, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's we'll get on to the benefits of Betfair as well, but mm. that's that's the good part about Betfair. There's always opportunities, you, whether you like them, you can back them, lay them and whatnot as well. So, yeah. but especially, Sorry, in, in yeah. society today, I mean, the responsible gambling is so important and... Um, the, I suppose the betting market and people out there getting opportunities to, um, I suppose the whole product is is getting to the stage where we've got to be careful about um, the industry that we have. And um, we like to think that socially conscious, like we do a lot of punters clubs and things like that. And yes. so many times people come up and say, well, just put it all on the last, you know. Like, yeah. It's just totally against our mindset is about um, getting the best possible return that you can. Mm. Yeah, and it's a it's a long game. Yeah. That's why we've been doing it for so long. Yeah. You're not just investing um, significant amounts on one race. It's always a it's a it's a long game. A uh, couple of things on staking. Do you have an idea of how much you want to stake into every race, or is it a, an amount of money you potentially want to bet on a race to win on a race, or what your liability is on a race. How do you go about staking a race, but then in a program, you mentioned don't get carried away. If you make money on the first, don't bet more. Mm. Is it a set 
structure of, of staking across the meeting, Brett? I've worked on a set straight staking structure lately. Yep. It's working quite well. I mainly do it especially because uh, often I have um, three children, so sometimes if I decide I'm not going to be able to be on the computer for the meeting, then I'll set up my plan. And Betfair is great with the, um, you can put on a lot of bets with a, you, you can target, put on a BSP bet. Yep. At You, you only and accept that bet at the, at the level you want to accept it at, the, the, the price you want, and um, it works out quite well. So you can you can get in there and, and stake your whole meeting, and I found that works quite well. That's really good. It's probably a tool that not many people know about. If your minimum bet you want to take mm. at BSP and it accepts it after, that's a really good point. Yep. Um, how about you? Darren? I'm a little bit different. Um, I, I certainly have a... Um, a you know, amount of money that I want to invest type thing yes. from my point of view of backing a horse. From laying a horse, I'm probably a bit more aggressive yep. um, and willing to lay it at a higher amount um, because I've got a real set against it. But I, I certainly have an amount that in my mind at all, but it's not a set specific. But, um, yeah, I think we all have um, degrees of um, liability that we, we set ourselves for. Do you have a bank? Is it a, like how do you, something I spoke to Terry about, yeah. you mentioned Terry, do you have a betting bank? Get the side. Do you take money from that bank to to do recreational activities or whatever it might be, or is it just a bank that sits there? How do you manage all that? Well, I suppose you know it's changed a bit over the years, I suppose. Mm. But um, right now, um, I have because ninety nine percent of my my bettings through Betfair, I have an amount that I want sitting in my Betfair account as a bank, more or yes, less. Yes. Yep. But I'm not percent. I'm not betting to a percentage of that bank at any time or anything like that. Mm. It's interesting. I think yeah. Terry was the same from memory. Mm. You know, because I, I found I you know, changed so much over yeah. the years. I found at one stage I was doing daily profit and loss. It just does your head in. Yeah, yeah. Because right. you're getting towards the last race. And you, oh, I want to make a profit. Well, it's ridiculous. Why do you want to make a profit on that, that one race? That mitigates the, the opportunities potentially. Or, That's right. It's just yeah, it doesn't exactly. make sense on the long term. So I think probably I have found now monthly and the fact now that. Um, because of the changes, you're getting monthly statements um, yes, telling you what yep. your, your profit and loss is over an extended period. I love that um, yep. because it just gives you a broad scale without intimidating you to think that you've got to make profit this day or this week and things like yep. that. Um, you mentioned you work together and in, in what, a lot of what you do. How often are you talking? W- wouldn't miss a day. Yep. Um, um, Always about horses? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Football. <laughs> you talk about football? Yeah. No, Who um, do we support? Both Hawthorne. Both Hawthorne, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But um, no, I never miss a day that we're not um, talking and, you know, depends on the meeting, but some meetings are more tougher than others and, um, you know, we'd probably speak 15 to 20 minutes about a meeting roughly. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Any um, blow-ups? Any any fights over uh, racing or...? It's natural too, but I think <laughs> I think the benefit we have that we're, as brothers, you just move on, you know. Yes, you, yeah. You say what you say and then, you know, move on. Mm. That's good. Any, any spring to mind, Brett? Oh, really? No. No, that's good. Yeah. You've obviously got a great relationship. Um, Nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <of> that. <laughs> Correct. Uh, I want to get to a couple of famous, uh, on your behalf, wins and, and whatnot coming up as well. But um, your Betfair journey, when did you discover Betfair and, and how did that all come about, Brett? Oh, I mean, I guess it must be in the later part of the 2000s. Yeah. Um, and I loved Betfair when I first got into it because there wasn't fixed odds in those days. So it's hard to imagine for the uh, young people out there, but betting on the tote was pretty precarious because mm. you never know what things were going to finish up at. So right from the start, we had a really good idea that something might end up starting $1. seventy. So five minutes before the race, there's $2.80 on Betfair. You know, thank you very much. Yes. Yep. And just... Be able to actually get your set, you know, it was amazing. I mean, there wasn't in play, and um, yeah, but we really enjoyed it right from the start. Yep. Yeah. I, I think it um, it's evolved so much as well. Like I think the game and everything yeah, has evolved, yeah. and your you both your ability to adapt from what you're doing potentially back in 2010 or 2003 oh, in the game. Yeah, it's, the game has changed so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Be harness. Any kind, yeah. And if I look at it, I think my earliest memories around about um, 2003 of, yes. of Betfair, yep. but I probably didn't start using it um, 
fully until 2009, but in those days you still didn't even have it on your phone, for instance. Yeah. Um, I remember going to the Inter Dominion one year and going to an internet cafe and plugging in my bets before going to the races. You know, it was just ridiculous. And <laughs> and then um, I, I think the biggest change for me personally has been the the, um, the, the change to using third party software um, and the ability to be able to react quicker. Um, yes. Without having to, you know. Are you talking it, more in play in that regard, or yeah, combination of both? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so just the ability to at one at one push of a button get set. Yes. Um, but um, certainly from an in play point of view, um, massive change, and that's just been able to complement everything else we do. Um, but yeah, it's just it'll change again, no doubt, and it's about how quick we, I suppose, adopt to that change. Yeah. That's really critical and. You know, things have happened a lot over the years about Brett talked about fixed odds and the changes and hmm. yeah, at patches would probably have been a bit slow to react, but I think now we're really trying to um, be on top of the game that way. What third party software do you use? I use Gross. Gross, um, yeah. We were invited to a session back in 2018. Um, yes. And um, for me personally. Through Betfair? Yes, through yeah. Betfair. That changed. Um, the way I do things, massive change. Mm. Great. So there's a few. The there's there's Grass, Bed Angel, yeah, a couple of others. Um, yeah, I think that was that day. It was Bed Angel and and Grass and yep. just Grass. It just clicked with me. Like and, and we've showed many. We've talked about this on the way here today. That we talk a lot of people about who are really really good punters, but just don't quite understand the whole concept of it. And it's just yep. about confidence in it and. It just clicked for us. It was just perfect for yeah. the, the model that we have anyhow. Mm. So if any, anyone watching this uh, wants to know about third-party software, please reach out. There's some great tutorials and education. Um, Grass and Bet Angel online on our Betfair YouTube and our hub as well. So go and check it out. Um, we're always happy to educate and um, tools like that are, are so important. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about this a little bit. I want to ask both of you individually. Um, why do you personally choose to bet on Betfair just quickly? I think the markets, uh, the odds are great, basically. That's the bottom line. Yep. Darren? I, I love the one-stop platform that I can see right in front of me what my profit and loss is on that exact race. I just love that concept. And I also like to be able to adapt, especially from an in-play point of view, when things change in a race. And I suppose it supports my background of knowledge of the information that I've got. And I think the advantage I have is being able to use that information then during a race and Betfair gives me that opportunity. Yep. I guess um, also, and we talked about this earlier, with the the firmers and drifters and, and market intelligence, um, you take all that into account, Brett, and you can use that to your advantage betting late and Betfair, is that right? I think so, yeah. I mean, so I, I'll give many, many examples where uh, I'll probably be set on something at 350 and then I'll go out to 480 and I'll bet again yeah. because I'm I'm confident. I've, yes. I've, Cross the I's and dotted the T's, and um, I, I think the market's wrong. So I'll I'll bet I'll extend my bet. Yeah. Because you know I think at the end we do this a lot. There's there's winning bets and losing bets, and but that's different to good bets and bad bets. So you can have a good bet and it doesn't win, and you've got to realise that. And it's a really good learning tool. Don't be upset if you don't win. Yes. Have you made a good bet? Yes. Do you, so do you reflect on your bets post meeting, post race, or is it just Definitely. a mental thing? You say Definitely. that I got that race right, but it didn't pan out. Absolutely, all win. the time. Yeah, yeah. And again, a benefit of having each other to, I suppose, air our grievances to each other sometimes as well, because some people do it in the wrong way, and we're lucky that we can say to ourselves, yeah, you know, whether that was a bad drive or um whether it was a bad tip you know some yeah. people <coughs> reprice markets after the race so they might have oh. taken two dollars oh wow um and a horse might not have won but if mm. they reprice the market it might be a dollar sixty chance for example yeah. so some mm. people have that mentality and actually put prices against horses it's not something you guys do but you do it subconsciously i think so yeah. yeah 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 interesting like you know you gotta everyone remembers the bad beats yeah. But sometimes I think you got to accept the lucky wins as yes. well, you know, because a lot of times after the race you might have got a win and you go, gee, it didn't win very well. I was a bit lucky there. Yeah. I think yeah. that that plays to almost responsible gambling as well, understanding, and it's something that a lot of probably recreational clients don't understand that you can have a, a really good bet and not make money on the race mm. um, and you reflect on it and say, 
gee, I got that right. Mm. I got the puzzle right because every race is like a puzzle, Absolutely. and that's what I love about racing. And See, I, I love puzzles. I love you know, correct. But I don't have time for them because I'm always doing these puzzles. <laughs> well, these are puzzles, <laughs> correct. And see, it, we're a firm believer. Every horse has its right race. Yes. And sometimes people will say, "How could you possibly back that horse with that driver and that trainer?" Yeah. And we're saying, "Well, this is the right race for this horse." And sometimes you know you, you get a good price because of those kind of factors. Mm. Yep. Uh, I've got to ask you, how is Betfair on your side? How is Betfair on my side? Well, I just think it's it's equitable system. Yep. I'm hoping there's people out there, if I'm winning off them, that the, tomorrow they're winning yep. off me, maybe. you know, a different dynamic. Of yeah, the different dynamic. Yeah. We've all got our opinions and it's a platform to uh, to um, spend on that opinion. Yep. Mm. Yeah, it's it's that's what I love about Betfair. And I think if you do have an idea, there's always ways to... Um, I guess play to your opinion <clears throat> and bet according to your opinion, and you don't get that at other WSPs potentially. The lay side of betting and the different USPs at, on the exchange um, and in play, obviously as well. I'll ask you, Darren, how is how's Betfair on your side? Uh, I think it's just it's the whole box and dice of everything about it. Um, the fact is that you can bet into something and, to a large extent, not give your game away too much. Yes. Um, so you're you're betting with you know, someone that's sitting opposite you type thing. Um, and if you just chip away, sometimes you don't make too big a dent in the market and you can keep chipping away. Um, so, but I love my favourite thing is just being in front of me exactly what my profit and loss is on in the, in the individual rate. So I just love that concept. Mm. I want to talk to you briefly about in play and you've had some ideas and some big wins and some interesting theories about a couple of runners that are in play and we'll show some replays coming up. But... Um, you you bet a lot in play, Darren? Yeah, um, since I've been, you know, I, I think even before I went and started using this third-party yeah, software, 2018. I can see myself at the trots with my phone, you know, plugging away type thing. I think I think back now, I think, what was I doing, you know? But I just, you know, at that stage, you know, saw opportunities and things like that. But, um, yeah, I love betting in play because I think it just um, is an, an additional support to, um, I suppose, what I've done all the already pre-race yep. and then in play whilst I'd love the liquidity to be you know a lot lot better than what it is it, it just gives me an opportunity sometimes to to react to the way in which the race map might change and things like that and it's how quickly you react to that um is the strength I suppose yeah mm. do you do much of it Brett? yeah definitely um yep. I think going back to the data is important in play because mm. sorry you're right the um lead times in the harness racing are very important so if you I keep a record of every track has a lead time, which is the time to the last mile. And that is a really good indicator of how far, how fast the, the early burn has been. Because as anyone who's looked at uh, trots in play would know, the leaders get a lot of attention. So if you find a race where the lead time has been either too fast or too slow, you can play to that, especially if it's been too fast. So um, you have an understanding of lead times. Is that to the mile? Yeah. Is that how it works? Yeah. Um, of each track? Yeah. And, and that's all in your head and then you No, use I, keep that. A, I have a you book. Keep it, yep. a bo every track has a, a published uh, the lead time, average lead time. Yep. So I keep a record of those and when the race meeting's on, I'll have that page open in front of me. So it, it, you have that, excuse my ignorance, if, if the race is being run or two minutes before the race, you'll look at that book and say the, late, the average lead time is this. Yeah, I'll just, I'll have it open in front of me, but also just put in my head yeah. so I'm ready to so yep. listen to that. If it's 42.7 seconds is the average, then the commentator says it's 40.6. I'll go, well, they've obviously gone too fast. Yeah. And some tracks you'll know it because they race some like Melton, for instance, they yeah. run. Some yeah. tracks, yeah, like Melton, yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's, and it's just a really good indication of how the race is going to pan out because yes. th that's a great thing about trots in play. So you get to the lead time, there's still 1,600 metres to go. That's two minutes. So that's a lot of time to make some bets. So you've got a lot of time after that lead time to decide how you're going to approach that race. And uh, drivers in the trots are really crucial. We're yes. lucky now. The Victoria and the depth in the driving ranks is unbelievable. There's probably 30 really good drivers in this state. And the young guys are really smart. They're just bit of a different generation mm. they're really patient they're just they appear to be really good learners and you know and form students form students how important mm -hmm. is reading tempo from a driver so important yeah and i think it's a real skill but they also be really good at it you know 
So it's really important if they've gone too hard, just wait, 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 you know. And James Urban's probably our favourite driver because he's just so good. There you go. And the other night he drove a horse that's a really d- tough horse to drive, pretty a bit crazy, and he sat back last on it, but he knew that I've got one job to get this horse to 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 trot smoothly, settle, and yep. And he did that and, and won quite easily in the end. But it was four dollars in play because he was just hanging out the back. So you would quite. you would see that driver change potentially and and have a kick. He gets he gets to the stage now where he's over bet. Yeah, uh, he's yeah, very significantly over bet. So then you've got to weigh up. At so some there's opportunities size. in play potentially, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah well, that also I'm talking about yeah. was start a favourite, but it went out in the run because he sat back last and just was very patient. But I'm like, that's fine. He yep. knows what he's doing. Yep. You know? I, yeah, I think from a in play point of view, trots just give you so many opportunities. Um, and probably one of the things that, because we've read the maps of the race, that there's times when there's a horse that's probably 90% chance it's going to lead. It might be $2.50 before the race. After 400 metres, it's, it's $1.50. Yeah. So there's a massive opportunity. If you're thinking 90% chance of this horse is leading at $2.50, and then after 400 metres, it's $1.50. What do you do? Are you laying that or backing others or a bit of both? Absolutely. You can back to lay. You know, yep. um, probably don't do as much of that as what I should do, but certainly um, a lot of situations where I might back something at $2.50 and it gets to ridiculous odds in the last lap, $1.30 or something like that, so, well, I'll chip out a little bit. I, and, I'm probably and, more conversely, yeah. as in lay to bet, so to speak, Tom, yeah. as in the amount of times a horse is $5 mm. and you know it maps bad, Oh, we know, sorry. Yes, yep. And yep. after 400 metres, yeah. it's $17. Yeah. And you had it mapped there anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, it's where crazy. else was it going to be? Yeah. yeah. You know? Like, yeah. You, you get the same in thoroughbreds as well. Yeah. Like a lot of, you mentioned leaders, but a lot of leaders are over bet yeah, in play absolutely. when they're going to lead anyway yeah. or, or back markers like Chautauqua per se. Yeah. You know it's going to be last yeah. in mm. a thoroughbred race. But you're getting that's right four or five dollars better and that's yeah. right so you don't back yeah. that horse early so you, you could wait. potentially yeah. Yeah. using yeah. that to our advantage yeah. Yeah. yep i want to talk to you about uh a shepherd and race back in 2017. um all pete is the name i believe yep. do you want to run us through that story well, it's interesting because that's um pre when i suppose we had the automated software too yes so, yeah um, so um this was a horse that we'd know it was a two-year-old trotter um, we identified that um, by doing the form and everything like that and watching the trials that this horse mate was um, prone to making errors in the race, but it was also a horse that settled pretty quickly. Um, but we thought it probably had 50 to 100 metres on this field. It was that much better than <laughs> that we thought. So I um, can't remember exactly, but it might have been $2.50 pre-race or something like that. I think so. And we... We've got some footage to yeah, show as well. So, okay. so before the race, we actually said to ourselves, okay, what are we going to do here? Um we think this is that much better than him, but we think it'll gallop. We actually want it to gallop. So you expected it to almost, you almost expected it to gallop. We wanted it to gallop and yeah. we expected it to gallop just after the start. And we <laughs> then thought, well, it's going to get out straight away. So yes. we started plugging in in those days. Well, we'll plug in some $8 and some $10 and some $12 yep. keep and keep them in play. Yep. Um, because as soon as it gallops, that'll get snapped up. And then, you know. Then you set. Then we set. Um, and so you anticipated this this horse, Old Brown Peak, to gallop. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and if yeah, it kept, if, it, if it kept galloping, it's like, oh well, well. Yeah. So it is yeah, what it is. Yeah. yeah. We we didn't date two dollars fifty. And if we were quick enough, we could have cancelled. Correct. Um, you know, cancelled as well. But we, yeah, you know, we backed ourselves, and it, um, the race unfolded, and it's probably still one of my favourite Betfair memories because we use Betfair to our advantage in that situation. That's amazing insight and. A, Great way of how you guys utilise Betfair, as you said, Dan. Yeah, I, I think you know a lot of times, um, you know, horses can gallop into harness racing and things like that, and they get out to ridiculous odds. And it's just about our understanding. Um, hey, can that horse still win now? And using it as an opportunity. A lot of people are thinking, oh well, I can't win, so I want to lay, lay, lay it. Well, yep. sometimes we're thinking the opposite. Um, gee, it's getting out to big odds now. I want to be backing that horse. Yeah, that's a that's a great shout. Mm-hmm. I want to take you back to Ballarat in twenty twenty as well. Uh, a horse by the name of Celtic Clash. Cash, Cash, yep. Cash is it? Yep. Celtic Cash. Mm-hmm. You guys clearly remember it well. <laughs> uh, what's the story of this horse? I like Brett one. You that one? Well, it's a bit of a similar tale. Um, the horse went to Marg or Paddy Lee's stable. I can't remember which of the two, but they're from Tarang. Sensational stable, especially with trotters. And um, this horse had showed a lot of ability at the trials had pretty bad figure form and it was a bit of a rogue 
but we'd seen it at the trials and it was a similar situation. It was in an, an okay race, but it's like probably had 40 metres on them, maybe 50, <laughs> and it was probably going to go around even money, yep. which is about the right price. But we thought... That seems absurd if it's got, obviously, the risk of it galloping was yes. factored into that price. It's yeah, got 40 absolutely. Or 50 the risk of it. it galloping was factored into that price. Yep. So that's why we thought, I'll probably still back it at $2. Yep. Because I think it'll win, but I hope, I hope it gallops early because I think it can gallop and give them 30 metres and I think it'll still win. And we'll get on at $10, etc. cetera. A bit like out of Aaron Pete. Yep. And uh, it did was a bit slow to score up. I think it might have missed a start by 30. Ooh, and, show, the, um, show the footage. I can't recall what it got out to, but similar situation as Darren was saying, it mightn't have been, you know, we weren't buying cars with it with the money, but it was very satisfying to have a strategy and for that strategy to come out exactly as you anticipate. Doesn't always happen, of course. But, um, and once it caught up, I was very confident in the run. That's also the, the beauty of Betfair, I assume, is that you can do stuff like this, which you can't do elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up in a minute. That's a great replay there. Um, just want to get some advice from you two. You've been around, you've done it so long, and I'll um, show you, you talk to your stats again on Betfair. So last financial year, you've had 22, uh, sorry, a 42% strike rate for your, your back bets. Um, 80% strike rate for your lay bets um, through your expert tips and a 66% strike rate on your best bets. It's incredible, really. Um, you've had some big wins in the last financial year as well, last 12 months. Um, BSP, uh, Maribyrnong Amunet, you remember that runner? Yeah. Uh, $11.92. Yeah, right. That was one of your your best. You've laid um, Midnight Dancer at $1.61 for followers on, on Betfair as well and you've had 152 um, tips at melton as well so that's your your most play that track but just obviously you've been very successful and you've done a lot you've been around for a very long time not just harness but generally speaking have you got any advice for for punters out there um any that may want to be dabbling into betfair exchange that don't necessarily do that or want to get involved in betfair or just in doing the form or the way you, you your methodology yeah um I'm a firm believer in finding something that works for you. Yes. And if that works for you, then stick at it um, because you don't have to copy off everyone. Um, just do what works for you. Um, I suppose at the moment, if you're looking at um, the trots and the current calendar, may create opportunities for people out there. And um, a lot of our audience today um, will probably be recreational type punters. Yes. Um, and time is everything. You know, and we talked today about the amount of information we have to do and, and go through. But with the calendar at the moment, for instance, um, shepherd and race every Tuesday, right? So my suggestion for a person out there who wants to get fair income about it, it would be to do things like just concentrate on certain um, areas. Tracks or tracks, jurisdictions. Yep. yep. Um, and therefore do the form on that track every week and it might be a day of the week that suits you because you don't play basketball on that day or yep, whatever yep. it is and stick to that track um do the form on that you can do all the trials on that you'll get to know the trainers and drivers at that track as well and then use that to your advantage to build that kind of library of information and then if that works for you then you might be able to extend that out to more and more tracks but that would just be my you know probably using the information that works for us in a smaller way and and seeing as it can make it work for you i love that advice do something and do it really well mm. rather than spreading yourself too thin and, and not having an edge or not yeah, finding it better i think you it summed yeah. it up perfectly tom yeah. like yeah. i just think it's so rewarding to just find a product i don't care whether it's afl mm. trots yes you know something you're passionate about well, i don't, I don't follow the gallops tennis. now yeah. but if you said to me what am i going to do brett You've, you've got to be on gallops this week. I might see, look at only 2,000 metre races plus. Yes, yeah, and yeah. then I'll do some research into that and I might come up with a strategy, something like that, because there's too many races out there all across the country or in your dad's case, betting on Vale on a... What, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, no, that was Terry Layton's dad. Was sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, My dad would bet on Vale, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot out there and I, I don't... Uh, yeah. If you can know what you're betting on, that's what you've got to know what you're betting on. Yep. Speaking of responsible gambling, and I 
I think you're going to enjoy it more if you know what you're doing. And I know you mentioned throughout your, there's no last race and you're betting regularly and trying to make small amounts along the way. Yep. It's a different different methodology if you're a recreational client because you don't want to go to the, the pub on a Saturday or whatever and sit down and bet on every race. If you know, if you do the form for three or four races, you probably are as a recreational client better to do the form and bet on those three or four races than betting across things you don't know. And you can only do that because you know the product so well. Mm. And you know every runner in the state and yeah. have that knowledge of everything. Yeah. Yeah, and if you don't win, don't be disappointed. Just analyse your decisions. And if you make good decisions, you're definitely going to come out better for it. Very good. Um, thank you, Toos, so much for joining us. Um, as mentioned, you can find Brett and Darren Carroll's information on the Betfair app and the Betfair hub. We uh, thank you from on behalf of Betfair. You've been uh, wonderful for us uh, and you're doing a great job. So if you don't follow these two, I recommend you do because they've been superb and they will continue to do so. Your record over the years has been outstanding. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. Thanks for having us. That's Layback with Betfair, episode one of the education series. Plenty more coming up. What's gambling really costing you? For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.